Hi everyone, welcome to Sports Insider. I'm Dan Lobby, joined as always by Chris Fedor. And as always, we have a packed show for you. We'll kick it off by talking Browns with Mary Kay Cabot. They have the Ravens this week, their first division game of the season. Then we'll talk Cavaliers. Their preseason is underway. We'll talk to Chris Haynes and, of course, Paul Hoynes. Look, another Indians front office <laughs> shakeup. I guess if you want to call it that, it's just the same guys kind of moving up the ladder. One game over 500. Here's your promotion. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So we'll talk to Paul Hoynes all about that. But first, as promised, let's bring in Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter. Mary Kay, how are you? I'm fine, guys. How are you doing? Doing all right. And Mary Kay, let's just start with this whole Joe Hayden thing. And, uh, you know, I guess really how Mike Pettin handled it, because that's really been what people have talked about. Uh, you know, he used the words Joe Hayden didn't want to play. Then a couple days later, he came out and clarified. We heard from Joe Hayden yesterday. Uh, how do you feel Mike Pettin handled this situation? Well, you know what? I actually, you know, on Monday, you know, when he first said it, of course, you know, it was, uh, you know, an eyebrow-raising thing to hear him say it the way that he did. And, you know, I think that uh, he handled it really, really well when he came out yesterday and said, you know, I, I assume some of the blame for the way that came out. That's not the way I meant it. Of course, Joe wanted to play. Uh, and then I thought Joe did a really nice job, too, uh, because he took some of the blame, too, uh, for not really impressing upon the coaches uh, just how hard it was for him to actually try to play all week and just how uh, how much he was battling that broken finger. And, uh, you know, so I thought he, he did a very nice job, too. You know, it's not like he, you know, put it all on the coach. I mean, he, he said, you know, it was a communication problem. I didn't let them know, you know, how I was really feeling. So I, I thought that uh, both sides did a nice job. I thought that they did a good job of communicating, uh, you know, with each other before, you know, they went public with how that went down. And, um, you know, and I think it, it helped sort of put the thing to rest a little bit. Mary Kay, could Mike Pettin's handling of players, though, come back to bite him? Just from the standpoint of, I don't want to go as far as to say that he coddles his players, but he has been very protective of guys. Dwayne Bow, Justin Gilbert, now Joe Hayden. He ran what some people phrased a country club atmosphere um, in training camp. Is this something that maybe uh, when Mike Pettin at the end of this season is being evaluated by Jimmy Haslam and Ray Farmer and Alex Shiner. Is this something that could bite him? Well, you know, I'm sure it's different behind the scenes, but publicly mm -hmm. you really want to back your players. Uh, I, I can assure you that, you know, Justin Gilbert running his, his car into a ditch was addressed uh, by the team. I'm sure they disciplined him for it. Uh, and, and I'm sure that, you know, that they talked to him about it. And, you know, when it comes to Joe Hayden, uh, you know, not playing in this game, you know, I'm, I'm sure that he probably, you know, expressed some dismay, you know, to Joe that day. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he, he handled it uh, the way that, you know, you would think a coach would when all of a sudden you have to make all those adjust adjustments on game day. So I, I think behind the scenes, you know, he probably brings down the hammer more than we see. But you, you really don't want to lose your locker room. So I don't blame him for, for coming out and, um, you know, and saying what he said yesterday because, you know, you could already see that players were jumping to Joe's defense, mm -hmm. and you just don't want to to feel like your coach is throwing anybody under the bus publicly. Uh, so I, I think he's got a handle on it. Mary Kay, obviously Joe Hayden has faced a lot of criticism for that decision not to play on Sunday. You know, this is a guy that doesn't really have a history uh, of doing stuff like this. He's a guy that, if he's if he can get out there, he's usually out there. Are you surprised at all that he's faced so much criticism? You know what, since we all know Joe so well, and since we've seen him, you know, gut it out and come back and play through, you know, the flu and other different injuries and those kinds of things, uh, you know, I, I think in this case, uh, you, you have to realize that, that Joe Hayden was really not able to play uh, because it's Joe, because we know his history. Now, if it, you know, if it were other play, you know, another player, you know, I think it might have been viewed differently. But there is no one in that locker room that would ever, ever even question Joe Hayden for not playing. And they would understand, you know, that, that this was something he couldn't do. I mean, there's guys that have to have hand surgeries. Remember, I mean, Sean Drone was out for a, for a long time mm -hmm. with, a, with a broken finger, broken thumb type of thing. So uh, these, these things can be very serious and not to be taken lightly. And if Joe says it was that serious, not to play in the game, then I think we need to believe him. 
Mary Kay, with that being said, do you expect Joe Hayden to be out there Sunday against Baltimore, first divisional game? Yeah, I do. I, I do think that he'll be out there in this game. I think, especially after what happened with the, you know, with the grief that he took, I, you know, Joe's human and, and he really does, you know, care about this team and the city mm -hmm. and he's passionate about what he does. And I think it was, it was very hurtful to him that, that people questioned him at all. So uh, I think even if he's not 100% ready to go, he's not going to be 100%. The finger's still broken. Uh, but I, I think that he will get out there and he'll play, even if his body's telling him it might not be the 100% right thing to do. Uh, Mary Kay, of course, uh, the domino effect put Justin Gilbert in the spotlight because he wasn't the guy, of course, that the Browns turned to on Sunday to replace uh, uh, Joe Hayden. In fact, he was again behind Johnson Batamosi. Uh, he did have some success in the return game, but uh, you know, ultimately, what does it say about Gilbert that he can't even beat out a guy like Batamosi, who it's been said multiple times he's on this team because of special teams? Well, you know, I mean, I, I think it, it's pretty, you know, evident that Justin Gilbert isn't ready for a lot of defensive duty right now. And it's a sad statement on, you know, the, the number eight overall pick from 2014. And, you know, by now he should be, you know, he should be ahead of Pierre Desir and Johnson Banamosi. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. If he's not that at this point, then, you know, this is not going, you know, in the right direction. So I would have to think that, uh, you know, that they're really almost coming to, to the conclusion that, that it might not work out, you know, with him in terms of, you know, being able to be a really super solid contributor on defense. Uh, I mean, you don't, you know, I think you want to give him through next year before you make that ultimate determination, but it seems like it's heading that way. Are we starting to see Duke Johnson's role increase as the season goes on, Mary Kay, with what they showed last week in the loss is that something that we should expect to see moving forward, him being that involved in the offense? Oh, absolutely. There's no question about it. Uh, you know, they need all the weapons that they can get, and they, they, they identify that he's one of them, especially mm -hmm. in the passing game. Uh, you know, they're doing motioning him out, splitting him out wide, getting the ball to him in, in different ways, and, uh, and they will definitely continue to do that. Uh, Mary Kay, the word of the week, for the defense at least, has been close. Should we believe the Browns? Should we believe this coaching staff when they say that this defense is close? Well, you know what, you guys, um, I, I'm not sure if you got an opportunity to see it or not, but Tremon Williams, actually, we had this, uh, we wrote this story yesterday. Tremon Williams uh, told me in the locker room yesterday, speaking of close, that he was not offside, told, that the NFL told the Browns that he was not offside on the kick. Um, so this turned into like a, you know, many hours long saga last night trying to sort <laughs> through all of this. Uh, and, you know, we have the story up now, and there is a, uh, you know, a little gif in there where you can kind of decide for yourself. But apparently, uh, Tremont, from what he told me, was told that he was not offside on the, on the kick, according to the NFL, after they looked at video. Uh, I did talk to uh, the NFL about that, and they said, "No, we never, you know, we never told him that he wasn't offside." Hmm. So there, I think there are some semantics going on here, but I think basically, in, in a nutshell, what it is is, I, I do think that he was told that it was that he was not offside from the end zone tape that they could see, but that when the when the line judge made the call at the time from the angle that he had. He did not blow the call because that he could not have possibly seen or known uh, that that he was not offside. All right, Mary Kay Cabot, our Browns beat reporter, joining us. Thanks for the time, Mary Kay. Thank you, guys. All right. Uh, I don't know. Maybe she she misunderstood the question, there, but mm. let, let's go back to the word close. Yeah. Words into action. That's kind of been the Browns' <laughs> mantra this just season. Tossing out all of them. Doesn't really seem like they're all that close. No. When you kind of look at what you're seeing out there. No, it actually seems, Dan, that they're closer on offense than they are on yeah. defense, which is a very, very surprising development for the Browns early on in the year. This defense should be so much better than what it is, and and I don't look at it as close. I think when you're ranked last <laughs> in the NFL. It rings very, very hollow to use the word close. Now, if they were ranked 20th in the <laughs> NFL, if they are ranked like 15th in the NFL, okay, you can say a few plays here or there, a few things in terms of an assignment here or there, but this is a defense that is getting torched 
not by Tom Brady, not by Aaron Rodgers. This is Philip Rivers. Philip Rivers is a terrific quarterback. But the week before that, Derek Carr? Yeah. <laughs> week one, Ryan Fitzpatrick looking comfortable? I mean, come on now. This defense has to turn things around and turn it around quick. And I'm guessing that they're probably going to play a little bit better this week against Baltimore and maybe stick out their chest and say, see, see, look at us. We were close. Baltimore doesn't have any receivers. <laughs> they don't have anybody. They've got Justin Forsett and they've got Joe Flacco, and that's it. Yeah, well, well, what Baltimore has that scares you is a pretty good running back. Yep. Coming off his best game. Right. And a really good offensive line. Yeah. So uh, we'll see if this defense is close because they're going to face the thing that they haven't been able to stop for, for about two years now. All right, let's shift to the Cavaliers now and bring in our Cavaliers beat reporter, Chris Haynes, joining us via phone. Chris, how are you? Doing fine, guys. All right, Chris, the preseason now is, is officially underway. Um, you know, look, nobody's looking at wins and losses. Really, the big story is health. But what can we learn about this basketball team as this preseason progresses? Well, I think, especially early on right now, they're, they're trying to really buy into Coach Blatt's uh, movement offense. Mm. And that was something that, you know, they kind of did it early in the season last year. And I think LeBron kind of hijacked the offense after he felt like it wasn't conducive to winning. But I think they're buying in more right now. It's, it's, the, it's, you know, it's the first piece of the game, but if you look at the offense, man, that ball was ripping. They were spaced out with James Jones at the power forward spot. The Hawks had to cover so much ground, it, it was just impossible. And you had J.R. Smith playing like he, he was – he was really the best player of, of the night, if you ask me, just how he was moving without the basketball. Then when he got the ball, he was able to put the ball on the floor and create for himself and others. And he wasn't just being selfish with, with launching those three. He was playing team basketball. And it looked really good. It really looked good on the entire team. Now, the first unit did that. The second unit, that, that's, a, that's a discussion for another day. But they, they definitely look good in doing what uh, Coach Black is wanting to do, which is move that basketball around and find the open man. Chris, continuity is a word that was used a lot last year for the Cavs, especially in the second half of the season. They thought coming into this year with all of their guys back and, and going through all the things that they went through last year that they were going to have that continuity. They were going to have that camaraderie. Obviously, no Kyrie. No Iman Shumpert. Kevin Love didn't play. He's not going to play tonight against Philadelphia. How is David Black going to get that continuity here in the preseason? Or is that something where the Cavs are just going to have to say, that's why we're going to have the regular season? Well, I think, you're, I think we're seeing it a little bit. And the good thing about easing on you know, a couple of the newcomers into, this, into the role of you know, trying to be rotation guys is that Mo Williams. Richard Jefferson, mm -hmm. these guys are veterans. They, they, they know, they understand how to play, you know, high level basketball and what it takes to win and succeed at this level. So incorporating them hasn't been a problem. You've seen that. Mo Williams, he struggled with the shot a little bit. He wasn't aggressive. And, you know, he, he know, he know, he knows where to take his spot. Uh, but continuity right now is that that second unit, mm -hmm. that's where the continuity issue is going to, going to take place. If he's really trying to, uh, play a platoon system going into the regular season. I don't think that's going to be the case. But I think right now he is trying to find some rhythm um, and get some guys in sync because you're not going to have Kyrie, Iman, Shepard when the season starts. So he wants to build up the confidence of some of those guys. You know, Joe Harris, he's going to have to work himself into play. And Anderson Verizal is going to you know, work himself into shape. Sasha Khan, I'm not sure he's a rotation guy this year and a lot you know last night he definitely did some good things you can tell he hustled he plays his butt off but he has problems finishing around, <clears throat> around the rim yeah and that was against a Hawks team that doesn't really have <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> doesn't really have a rim protector so yeah. um there's some things that need to get going on but you know that's what the preseason is for and that's what Coach Black is looking for is trying to see what group he can instill still in there to play extended minutes and really build some continuity Chris, this team did so much in the offseason, added so many different guys. That there were times when I kind of forgot, hey, Richard Jefferson is on this <laughs> roster. And, of course, last night he had that thunderous dunk. Ultimately, with a healthy Cavaliers team, when they have their full roster, if they do at some point during this season, what is Jefferson's role? 
I think he, he's a legitimate backup to LeBron James. And I think, you know, I wrote this morning, you know, wrote a column about how he, he has a golden opportunity to go down in history as the best backup to LeBron James. And, uh, you know, that's not to degrade or put Richard Jefferson down at all. He has had a, a tremendous career, uh, borderline all-star in this league. But LeBron James has never really had – that backup guy and Richard Jefferson, you know, he struggled. I believe it was two for nine from the field last night. Yeah. But you see, you see, you see the signs. You see, he was able to get his own shot. He, he was able to go in the post and he create for himself. So he, he's going to get better, and he's a career thirty eight percent three point shooter. So his shot is going to be there. So if they can get LeBron James' numbers down, if LeBron James will be willing to allow David Black and the coaching staff to bring his minutes down, that's only going to bode well for the Cavaliers, you know, at the latter part of the season as they enter the postseason because you'd you rather have a fresh LeBron James enter a postseason play than a sluggish one. And a fresh LeBron James, if it is a fresh LeBron James, it will be due to the fact that Richard Jefferson can go in there and play some high-level minutes. Chris, I posted a story um, about 30 minutes ago. ESPN's Jalen Rose, he was on Mike and Mike in the morning earlier today, and he was asked about whether the Cavs are the favorite in the NBA. And he said, no, they're probably the fifth or sixth best team in the league. You agree with that? Man, that's pretty low. Yeah, I thought so, so he's too. Basically, he's, basically putting, he's basically putting five teams in the Western Conference yes. above the Cavs. Right. Right. So who will be the that five? Let's go. Golden State, probably. San Antonio. San Antonio Clippers. He That's said. Four. He also said the Thunder. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm not going that far. So that <laughs> will be his 15 then. Yeah, that's that's. I will. The the lowest I will peg the Cavaliers will probably be number three. Uh, Golden State and San Antonio. I don't think I like the move that Los Angeles made, but we still got to see a play out on the court. Uh, the addition of Ty Lawson in Houston, mm-hmm. they're definitely going to pay some dividends. But hey, those are Lawson and James Harden are two ball dominant players. Can they play together? Can they coexist? Don't know. OKC, yeah, hey man, that you know Westbrook and Durant have battled health issues throughout their career. Yeah, I, I can't I can't put the Cavs all over them three. So five or six, that, that's just the end. Nah. I, I'm, I'm, I think Rose got it wrong on that one. But this is, this is a team. I'm not letting you go without getting a Tristan Thompson questioning, Chris. <laughs> oh, oh, man. I thought, <laughs> so, I, was, I thought I was good. I, I, a lot of fans have taken the side of the Cavs. And I get it. Look, I've taken the side of the Cavs as well. I've said Tristan's not worth $80 million. He's a bench guy. He's limited offensively. He can't make a shot outside three feet. So I understand where fans are coming from because I have the same kind of stance. But I'm curious, Chris, how much do you think in this negotiation, in this back and forth, is, should be laid at the feet of the Cavs? Uh, probably the majority of it. You know, look, hmm. uh, the Cavaliers, it's, it's up to them. To, you know, they get the deal to get a deal done. It, it's more urgency on their part, and the reason I say that is because, well, it should be more urgency on their part because they, they they need to get their guys in camp. They need everybody in. This has the, this season has the potential to be a special year. I don't think the Cavs can win it without Travis. And people may may call me stupid. I, I don't think so. I think you need somebody out there doing the dirty work, doing all the hustling, the grinding. And that's Trish. Yep. Now, the thing with Tristan, his camp, Rich Paul, Mark Termini, those guys are willing to wait. They, they feel no rush. And so, yes, what, you, know, you know, people are saying that the Cavaliers are already overpaying them with the offer that they got out there. That may be true, but it's like who, who's in, who's in a, a worse situation right now? Is it the Cavs or Trish? Trish willing to wait this thing out. Eventually, the deal is going to get done, guys. Yeah. It's going to get done. And so – you know, do you you have to look at it? You know, are they willing? To, is ten million more dollars really uh, that important to where we can lose a, a key cog into getting us to that championship run? And I think that's what it's going to boil down to. The longer and longer this thing drags on, you may call me stupid, but I think it plays in the in the, in the favor of Tristan and his camp. So 
I think the deal needs to get done. I think maybe Herb get this thing wrapped up. Uh, like I said, at this point, it's not about who who comes out on top on each side, whatever. It's about making sure everybody is in in in, in town and, and not in Miami, uh, trying to get this championship because this will probably be the best year uh, that the Cavaliers will have of trying to solidify that goal. LeBron will be 31 this year. You don't know how many seasons he has left. All right, thanks a lot, Chris. Take care, Doc. Um, interesting, going back to Jalen Rose, it doesn't matter how many Western Conference teams he ranks in front right. of the Cavaliers. The bottom line is they only have to beat one. That's right. So, you know, you can put eight, nine, yeah. ten Western Conference yeah. teams. The advantage of being in the East, you only got to beat one of those yeah. teams. Yeah, and they were talking about it on the broadcast last night, and I was talking about it in the, in the chat that we were doing during the first preseason game. Just who is that, that second-best team in the Eastern Conference? Chicago didn't do anything. Chicago last year had as good of a shot as Chicago's going to get against LeBron James. There was no J.R. Smith for two games. Kevin Love was injured. Kyrie Irving was less than 100%. And they couldn't get it done then. Yep. And then this offseason, they didn't do anything. They brought in a new coach and Bobby Portis. That's <laughs> supposed to be the difference between you beating LeBron James and not beating LeBron, a coach, in Portis? Come on. Yeah, there's going to be better teams in the East. Yeah. But we're not talking about the top two teams. We're talking oh. about, you know, maybe the Orlando Magic will be better. Okay, but they're not going to win the East. Right. They're not going to challenge it. Right. Maybe the Boston Celtics will be better. Yeah. I mean, I think we're at a point right now, Dan, where the Cavs' biggest competition besides themselves is Miami, LeBron's old yeah, team. Probably. All right, let's uh, switch gears and talk Indians. We'll bring in our Indians beat reporter, Paul Hoynes, via phone. Hoynesy, what's going on? Hi, guys. How are you doing today? All right, not too bad, Hoynesy. Lots of guys in the Indians front office doing well, of course, <laughs> this week. They get promotions. Chris Antonetti is uh, the new president. Uh, Mike Chernoff, he is the new uh, general manager. Let, let's talk about Antonetti first. Is he still going to have a heavy hand in baseball operations, or is he going to take on the Mark Shapiro role of – uh, you know, pushing the ballpark features, being the face of the franchise. Well, how does his role change? I don't think his role changes at all. Um, I think he's still the top baseball guy. The, the buck stops with him in all baseball decisions. I think this is more like a cosmetic move. So they didn't want to lose Chernoff. He was getting some feelers, some other teams. So, you know, they bump, uh, they bump Antonetti up to give him a new title. They, you know, they give uh, Chernoff, now he's the GM, and Derek Falvey is the assistant GM. Everybody gets a raise, I would imagine, and everybody's happy. But I don't think the dynamic on the baseball side of things change. I don't think, I mean, Paul Dolan is kind of, I guess right now is probably assuming Mark Shapiro's role. And, uh, you know, in talking to, to Antonetti, I think if, if he wants his, you know, if he won't, Wants to talk. I mean, he answers strictly to Dolan now. You know, Shapiro is out of there, so there's no middleman between Antonetti and Dolan. So, um, you know, if, if I guess if they're going to they'll discuss some business stuff, but from from what the way I understand it, you know, Antonetti's strictly strictly a baseball guy right now. So, what's going to change for this team going into the off season, if anything, then Hoinsey? Yeah, you know, I. <laughs> that's that's the you know that's. That's the big question. Uh, you know, we know one, they're not going to be a big player in the free agents, free agent market. Uh, two, uh, you know, they, they have, you know, a surplus of starting pitching. And three, they've got about three or four holes in the middle of that lineup that need to be filled. So, you know, I mean, a logical person would say you've got to trade one of your pitchers to help, uh, you know, to help the lineup because, Offense is probably the only thing that kept you out of the, the postseason this year. Uh, Hoinsey, this kind of piggybacks off of Fedor's question about what's going to change. You, you know, on, on the one side of town, of course, you have the Browns who change all the time. <laughs> uh, with the Indians, it, it's been a kind of a constant stream of just promoting guys and, and whatnot. And since about 2001, there hasn't been a, a lot of success. Is what the Indians are doing working? <laughs> is it not working? How, how would you rate it? Well, <laughs> you know, in, in terms of uh, postseason appearances, it, it, it has not worked. Uh, you know, they, they made the wild card two years ago, uh, but that was a one and done. And uh, you, ask, you can ask Pittsburgh fans how they feel about that. Today. Oh. And, uh, um, you know, 
So, you know, I, they've had three winning seasons. You know, I guess, you, you know, you can take, you can build on that a little bit. But, you know, as far as, you know, competing in the division and uh, being a legitimate postseason contender, they haven't been. And, you know, I think there's, you know, I, I, I like stability in an organization. I think, uh, I think, you know, that's how you, you, you establish, you know, a, a winning tradition. That's how, you, you know, you, everything is the same every year. There's not a constant turnover. But, uh, you know, sometimes things can grow stale, too. So I, I think they can, they're kind of caught in, in between right now. Knowing the Indians like you do and talking to the Indians all the time, Hoinsey, how do they define success? Like for them, was this past year successful because they finished one game over 500? Was it not successful because they didn't make the playoffs? How do they define it internally? Uh, you know, they, they, they did not think it was a success. Uh, okay. You know, the first thing Chris Antonetti uh, said, you know, at his postmortem on Tuesday was, you know, it's disappointing to be sitting here talking to you guys right now at this time of the season. You know, when the season started, we expected to be in the postseason. Um, so in, in that regard, this was not a success. I think uh, they can take something from the second half, uh, you know, where, where they played winning baseball, where, you know, they made some changes. But that doesn't change, you know, the the, <laughs> the overriding problem that you've got maybe three-fourths of a ball club. You've got a decent defense. You know, a, a dramatically improved defense. You you have starting pitching, you have a bullpen, but you have a, an offense that scored the 11th, ranked 11th in runs scored this past season. And to improve, you know, that's an expensive proposition to improve that, no matter how you look at it. And you know, that's the problem they're facing. Hoynes, you brought up the second wild card, and obviously that's been a big conversation uh, here in this town and all around baseball, actually. And I think everybody understands why it's in there. Um, I think it made for an exciting race, especially in the American League. It came down to, to the very end with, with Houston and Los Angeles and a bunch of other teams had a chance going into September. But there's the other side of it where you have the Pittsburgh Pirates nearly win 100 games on the year. And their reward for nearly winning 100 games is facing Jake Arrieta in a one-and-done situation. So... Do you think Major League Baseball should should change the way that the wild card is done? And the NBA is going to, all right, the top eight teams, divisional winners, that doesn't matter. It's all based on record. Do you think Major League Baseball should do away with the divisional format and just say, all right, the fourth and fifth best records, those are the two teams that are going to play um, in that wild card game? You know, I, I, I like the divisional setup. I okay. like... Uh the rivalries and, you know, the weighted schedule that, that, you know, puts, that puts an, an emphasis on winning the division. Mm. I, I like that part. You win the division, you know, you can take a deep breath. What I don't like is, you know, that one game knockout that, that isn't baseball. You know, that's not a true test of your team or your 25 man roster. I, you know, I don't know if you shorten the regular season so you can, you could, uh, you know, play a, a best to three. I think that would at least, you know, give give teams like the Cubs and 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 the, and the Pirates really a chance to, you know, really show what show what kind of talent got them to 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 that to that position. You know, to, to me, it's, you know, I know it's it's a dramatic thing, but you know, that's that you play 162 games to play nine innings, and you run into you know an Arietta at. <laughs> When, it, when he's rolling like no other pitchers rolled yep. since uh, the All Star break, and and that's it. That's what you get. I mean, geez, oh man. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a tough call. And you know, I know there's been some talk like, you know, maybe you could play a doubleheader. You know, the two wild card teams could play a doubleheader like last night, mm. and if a, and and play a third game the next day. You know, there's been a whole bunch of different things, and but you know, I think if this. This was kind of an, an anomaly, you know, the three best teams in the, in, the, in, in, the, in the National League coming out of one division, I think. You know, and, but, if, you know, if it continues to happen, that obviously you're going to have to change because that's not fair. It's, it, it's, you know, your best teams aren't 
it's not fair to those teams, and it's not fair to Major League Baseball or the fans because they're not getting the chance to see the best teams, you know, in a prolonged postseason. Pirates wouldn't say it's an anomaly. They had to go against <laughs> yeah. Madison Bumgarner last year and Jake yeah. Arrieta yeah. this year after having such success during the regular season. They're like, what the world? I know. <laughs> Hoinsie, we know, uh, we now know the matchups for uh, for the divisional series, and uh, we're looking at the at the World Series. Who do you have? Who uh, who wins the World Series? Oh boy. Uh... You know, I I, um, I I think you know. I guess you got to go with St. Louis. You know, and I mean, they've been. You know, but you know, I don't know. I think the Cubs kind of have that 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 momentum. I, I would love to see the Cubs get into the in, in, into the World Series. That that would be that would be. You know, I don't know. When, when was the last time that happened? I don't know. I, they haven't won it in over a hundred years, so nineteen whatever it is, sixteen or whatever. So I think maybe maybe the Cubs and. Uh, from from the American League, you know, I think Kansas City's beat up a little bit. Uh, Texas, I think, you know, kind of, you know, they, they need they got a break. But uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, I, you know, I don't know if it's Houston. You know, I, I I'm going to go with Kansas City. I think I'm going with Kansas hmm. City and and the and the Cubs getting in, in there. Does uh does Mark Shapiro get a ring if the Blue Jays <laughs> if the Blue Jays win? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I don't know. Yeah, no, he might. You know, because he's the boss now, so he can get yeah. anything he wants, right? I guess so. <laughs> Put that on the resume. World Series that's winner. Right. Yeah. If, if nothing else, if nothing else, he can afford to buy his own ring. I guess. So. All right, Hoinsie, right. appreciate you taking the time. Thanks, guys. All right, that was Paul Hoynes. Of course, Chris Haynes joined us earlier. Mary Kay Cabot as well. Thanks to them. He's Chris Fedor. I'm Dan Lobby. Thanks for watching.